Good evening and welcome to another installment of the Thought Leaders Lecture Series, proudly brought to you by Space Center Houston and UTMB Health. I'm Dr. Janak Patel, Director of Infection Control and Healthcare Epidemiology at UTMB. And this is my colleague, Dr. Philip Kaiser, the Galveston County Health Authority and also a UTMB Professor of Internal Medicine. As physicians and people of science, we share your appreciation for exploration, research and discovery. In our profession, we see its positive impact every day. As a nation, we've never shied away from a scientific challenge. In 1961, when President Kennedy pledged to go to the moon, NASA scientists rolled up their sleeves and got us there. Today, we face this challenge of a different sort, the COVID pandemic. Yet, here we are with a modern day version of the moonshot, with a safe and effective vaccine deployed and tested in less than a year. At UTMB alone, nearly 200 of our researchers have been involved in sequencing and understanding the virus, developing new testing platforms and conducting clinical trials of vaccines and treatments. While they're working in the labs, our healthcare providers have been busy in the clinic and at the bedside, buying time and deploying better therapies. Now it's your turn. You can fulfill your role in the COVID-19 challenge by getting the vaccine as soon as it's available to you and encouraging your family, friends, and neighbors to do the same. Visit the UTMB COVID website to learn more. Thank you and enjoy this evening's presentation. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston. We're a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination. Uh, we are a nonprofit science center and also serve as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world through on-site and virtual programs. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Exploring the Mars Perseverance Rover, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our series features space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Today's program will focus on the Mars Perseverance rover and the pivotal role we anticipate it will fulfill in the search for ancient life on Mars and how it will provide critical information to help plan crewed missions in the future. You'll hear from leading experts on these fascinating topics. Through our Thought Leader series and other programs, Space Center Houston makes science and space exploration learning accessible to everyone. Space Center Houston is open with new exhibits, new live shows, a new film and spacious outdoor experiences with health and safety measures at the forefront of our daily operations. We invite you to join Space Center Houston this spring and take part in what's happening now in space exploration. You can watch the Perseverance land on Mars along with special activities on Thursday, February 18th. Touchdowns projected at 2 p.m. Central Time. Friday is third of this February is Members Appreciation Month. We're celebrating our loyal members with special discounts and more. We love our members. We'll take you back in time to relive the excitement of the Apollo era with our spring special exhibit, Apollo When We Went to the Moon. Don't forget, you can save time in line with advanced time admission tickets. You'll experience one of our most popular experiences, the NASA Tram Tour, which takes guests behind the scenes at NASA Johnson Space Center. Through the Space Center Houston free app, you can select and reserve seats on the tram tour you wish to board at a designated time, so no more waiting in long lines. Plan your journey with us today. Go to spacecenterhouston.org to review our Know Before You Go guide for more information on planning your visit. And now on with our January Thought Leader program, Exploring the Mars Perseverance ro Rover, presented by UTMB. Our panel of experts include Kim Stebman, Dr. Sarah Milkovich and Dr. Farah Albay, who will discuss the Mars Perseverance rover, how it was engineered to land on Mars, the science goals we aim to achieve, and how the rover will help inform future astronaut missions to Mars. Our first panelist is Dr. Sarah Milkovich, a science systems engineer at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Planetary Science from California Institute of Technology, a Master's degree and PhD in Planetary Geology from Brown University. She has experience with science planning and operations for landed and orbital spacecraft, as well as geomorphology and planetary science research. Milkovich has worked as an investigation scientist on the High Resolution Imaging Experiment, or HiRISE, on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as the Ultraviolet Imaging Spectrograph, UVIS, on the Cassini spacecraft. Dr. Farah Alabe is a systems engineer at JPL. 
She earned bachelor's degree and PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT and her master's degree from the University of Cambridge, all in aerospace, aeronautical and astronomical engineering. As a systems engineer, Farah helps design the initial spacecraft by working with the different subsystem experts, such as thermal, telecommunications, and power, and collaborates while keeping within the launch vehicle and spacecraft capability. She served as a payload systems engineer on the InSight Mars lander, and she worked on a solar mission to Saturn, aiming to look for life on Enceladus, one of some 82 moons orbiting Saturn. Our third panelist, Ken Sebman, is a spacecraft systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Kim earned Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Aerospace Engineering degrees from Georgia Tech and has over 16 years of experience working at JPL. She's also worked on several projects, including the X-2000, Mars Exploration Rover Mission, Cassina Huggins Mission to Saturn, and the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Rover. Our panelists will now provide more information about their backgrounds and the scope of their work, followed by a moderated discussion. So we'll now start with Dr. Sarah Milkovich. Sarah. Thank you. Mars today is a, is a cold desert. This is a picture of the surface of Mars from Curiosity. Um, and, uh, but we've been studying Mars for uh, decades from, uh, from our spacecraft um, and from everything we've learned over the last 20, 30 years, Everything that we've learned from orbiters and landers, um, we were pretty sure that ancient Mars actually had a lot of surface liquid water. So modern Mars, cold and dry. Ancient Mars, rivers, um, possibly lakes and oceans. We're talking 3.6 billion years ago time frame. So why is that so intriguing? Well, the thing is, is that at that time period, ancient Earth and ancient Mars were a lot more similar to each other than they are today. So they both started out with similar environments and have kind of uh, evolved in two different directions since then. In that 3.6 or so billion years uh, time period, on Earth, we already had life evolve on the surface of Earth. It, um, so this is a timeline uh, of the the biology of Earth. So, you, so we've got the, the beginning um, when the Earth formed, and it's really not that long afterwards where we get the first evidence of bacterial life. So the big question that we have is, if ancient Earth and ancient Mars were similar, and if life started in that time frame on ancient Earth, maybe it could have started on Mars as well. Why not? And um, so that's really what we're all about with the Perseverance rover. So what are we talking about when we talk about ancient life? What should we look for? Um, now, when you think about ancient life, you may think dinosaurs. You may think, you know, if you're thinking even simpler than dinosaurs, well, you know, fish, leaves, classic fossils, everything we think of as classic fossils is actually less than 650 million years old. So we're talking about very ancient, very, very simple life. We have evidence of, micro of microbes that are up to 3.6 billion years old and um, these, these things called microbial biosignatures. So that's what you see on the slide. That is a set of, um, the, the those shapes are basically um, algae mats, little mats of microbes that have built up and then died and were preserved in the rocks. That's a, that, that creature is a thing called a stromatolite, and that's some of the, the oldest life on Earth. Stromatolites exist still today. Um, here is a picture of stromatolites in Shark Bay, Australia, and it's this, it's this shape where you have a layer of, um, basically a layer of pond scum, and dirt collects on the top and then more microbes grow on the top of that and you just slowly build up this, this curved shape um, of layers and layers of microbes. Also in Australia, we have the record of ancient stromatolites. Now, so if you picture one of those sort of pillows and you cut it in half, this is what you see. Um, those, you can still see that echo of those curved shapes 
However, this one is three and a half billion years old. This is some of the oldest evidence of life on the Earth. And that's exactly what, if we could go to Mars and we could see something that looks like that, that would be so amazing. So when we're talking about looking for evidence of ancient life on Mars, we're, look, we're not thinking about we're going to find dinosaur bones. We have to go look for at the physical and chemical structures in the rocks. We have to look at what kinds of organic molecules might be there. Um, maybe we can find uh, biominerals. We're looking at the details of very subtle patterns in the rocks that have to have formed in the presence of biology. That is super hard to do. And it turns out there's only so much you can do with a rover. And you're going to hear more about our rover. Our rover is amazing and has really cutting edge science instruments. But again, there's only so much you can do for looking when you're thinking about subtle patterns, subtle variations in the rocks that tell you about changes in chemistry that had to have been formed by life. So we are actually the first part of um, a potential Mars sample return campaign. Um, we uh, this is a, a a campaign that we're working on, um, NASA is working with other space agencies around the world, um, and this is all notional. This is not official in any way, but the, uh, um, but the idea is that we collect the samples um, and we uh, then place them on the surface of Mars. And then the next mission, which is already um, being talked about and being worked on what it might look like, collects those samples and launches them into orbit uh, using a Mars Ascent vehicle. Then another mission comes and captures that, uh, that box that's in orbit carrying our very precious samples and brings it back to Earth so that we can study these rocks with, um, from Mars with all of the powerful instruments that we have in our um, biology laboratories and geobiology laboratories here on the Earth. We're doing a lot of really exciting science on our own, but we are also the first stage of an incredible scientific campaign. Our specific goals and objectives with this rover is to understand the possibilities for life on Mars. That includes ancient microbial life, as I was just talking about, but it's also understanding what might be needed to support future human life on the planet. So what do I do on the Perseverance team? I am a science systems engineer. Basically, I am a scientist by training, but I live embedded in the engineering teams to be a bridge between the two groups to work to get the best. Ultimately, I'm working to get the best scientific data return within engineering constraints from our spacecraft. I started on Perseverance back in 2013 before any of this rover existed. Um, I was, worked for the science definition team and I've got a little picture there of um, the room we used for doing some of our planning. This was a group where we, we thought about, well, what are the next steps in understanding Mars? And what are the big questions? And how can we use a rover to understand them? And, um, and at various times, we had the walls just covered with printouts um, outlining our logic of how we got to our science objectives. Then from 2014 to 2019, I've been working on designing operations processes, software concepts. I've been working with the hardware designers on how their choices affect the science that we're going to get. And then this past year, I have been working more directly with our science team. We have 450 international team members. And, uh, and so I've been working to make sure that they're all ready to go to start collecting their science data when we land. So here is our rover. This is Perseverance. And outlined here are all of our science instruments. We have detailed chemistry, uh, instruments at the end of a long arm, Sherlock and Pixel. Um, those are going to look for those subtle patterns in the rocks. Um, we have a weather station, Meta. We have 
SuperCam and MastCam Z are our two instruments on top of our mast that are like our eyes and also ears. There's a microphone up there as well. And they're going to look around at the at the rocks and look um, look for look at the shapes and the colors and the mineralogy of the rocks to find good places to go up to and investigate with our arm. We have RIMFAX, which is a, um, a radar instrument. It's going to, as we drive along, it pulses and looks at what's going on below the surface of our rover. And we have MOXIE, which is working to understand how to produce oxygen from the Martian carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. And this oxygen is what can be used in the future. Um, this concept is, is uh, for the future exploration with humans because we need oxygen not just for the astronauts to breathe but also oxygen to get us uh, to to fuel an ascent vehicle to bring our astronauts back home and with that i will turn it over to farah thank you sarah that was absolutely fascinating and i cannot wait to get to the q a i have so many questions about how you make decisions around what experiments are going to be done in the hierarchy it sounds like a fascinating process. Now we're gonna hear from Dr. Farah Alabey. Farah, thank you so much, please take it away. Yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, Sarah gave a wonderful introduction as to what the science, the science we're gonna be doing on Mars, what instruments we're bringing with us, and really what the goals of the mission are. In the next 10 minutes or so, what I'm going to give you is sort of what my background is, what I do, uh, which is sort of the engineering, right? How do we take those instruments, stick them on the rover, test it all, make sure it's going to work when we get to Mars, and get that thing shipped off to Mars? Okay, so one thing I want to highlight here is, you know, uh, Perseverance is a complicated beast. It takes you know, it took about a decade to build and it wasn't built just on its own. It's actually a reuse of the Curiosity design, the rover that's already on Mars and sort of an improvement on it. So you might have heard Sarah talking earlier about the fact that you know, she was working on the science definition team back in 2013. That's how long it's been since people have been talking about this mission. Um, the build for that started a few years after that. It took about six years to build the rover. Somewhere along the way, a few years ago, we also picked um, the landing site. It was part of the science team's work. And if you are at all listening to the news over the summer, you will have heard that we finally launched in 2020. Um, so we're currently uh, in, in July of 2020. So we're currently on our, our way to Mars. We're actually um, just a few weeks away from landing and we'll be landing at noon ish Pacific time on the 18th of February and right up when we land, you know, one concept that people sometimes have a hard time to like wrap their heads around is we land wheels down ready to go, right? Like you're seeing the the um, the image there. We get deposited on the surface of Mars, wheels down. We have a few days to do some checkouts and Kim is going to talk to you about sort of that concept later, um, but we essentially land ready to go. So I'm gonna focus on sort of the design and build part of the rover and sort of give you an idea of what does it look like to build a rover? How How do we do that? So this video here is going to show you sort of a highlight reel of all of the testing that we did um, for Mars 2020. This is our clean room you're seeing, that's our descent stage. This is our crew stage, just the housing that the rover is in right now. And the back of it is where the solar panels is. And you can see here, right, the sheer scale of all these things. One of the challenges is even moving that thing from building to building, even on our campus, it's, it's quite an affair. Um, the room that you're seeing here is a special room. It was what we did sort of, we mimicked um, space uh, and the space environment. Here you're seeing things like how we build the wheels, all of the little steps that we have to do, how we assemble um, our, our mobility system. And you'll see that one of the things that we did that takes an extreme amount of time is we have to mimic all of the motions, all of the operations that we're going to do on Mars um, here on Earth before we go. So you're seeing here they we're, we're testing, for example, things like drilling. You saw the mast being moved, the arm being moved here. Every single step that we're going to do on Mars, we do on, here on Earth. So that was about a five month campaign that I was pretty heavily involved in um, in helping test the rover. 
So this is where the rover was built. This is at JPL, it's one of our buildings. And you can see at the back our wall of fame. This is actually the building where pretty much every single JPL mission in the past 50 years has been built. And one of the cool traditions that we have is for every spacecraft that is built in that room, uh, once you know, once it's in its mission, it gets a badge of honor on, on that back screen. So I haven't actually been to lab all that much. I do go a little bit in the past few months, but I'm looking forward to seeing you know, our logo being back up there um, once we land on Mars. Uh, but you can see that that room is huge and it has um, the rover, the crew stage and the descent stage all in one there. Um, that's where we did all of our building, all of our testing. And the reason why that room is special is because it's incredibly clean. Um, it has to stay clean both because the hardware, you know, you can't have any dust or anything on there. It's not like there's a AAA on Mars that you can call to like clean your camera if there's any dust or fingerprints. But also because as Sarah mentioned, we're going to look for signs of ancient life on Mars. So we can't bring any Earth life with us because if our instruments all of a sudden are seeing anything, you know, in their measurements, we want to make sure that that was things that were already on Mars before and not something that we brought with us. So there's really, you know, strict um, cleanliness requirements when you're going in that room. That's why you saw the folks in their bunny suits and things like that. Um, it goes down to even like, making sure that you're not wearing perfume, that you're not wearing scent, you know, using scented shampoo. It's it's really uh, an interesting engineering problem to make sure that we don't contaminate our own spacecraft. One of the things that I really like to highlight and the reason why I love my job and I love working on this spacecraft is because, you know, the entire rover was built and managed out of JPL um, and I work there. Like, I get my friends work there and these that picture here what you're seeing is you know you can see it in their eyes these are some of my friends and they were super happy they installed the mast that day and it is just so cool to be able to say that my friends and i are building a rover that's going to mars like i mean come on and i get paid for it um but it's such an incredible feeling to to say that's literally what it's like to be on this team right it's we're, we're building a rover together. We're going to Mars. We're going to look for life. Like, just crazy. Um, so I love showing that picture because it highlights, you know, what this is for me. It's not just my job. It's kind of my passion also. So my background specifically is I work, uh, part of my job is working on the mobility team. And one of the uh, big tests that we had to do last December was the first drive of the rover. Essentially the, the rover got its driver's license. So this is the only test that we did with the flight vehicle. Uh, we set up sort of what we call a dance floor for the rover and had it drive um, straight, you'll see a drive over uh, a ramp. It actually did some turns and basically that was just us making sure that um, that it was, you know, everything was built correctly, that it could drive in its own direction, in the right direction, things like that. And it attracted quite a crowd. Uh, what I find really funny with this video is you see all these engineers sort of like watching really closely the drive system, making sure that nothing's going to break. And the crazy thing is this is the one drive we did on Earth and the next drive we're going to do is on Mars and none of us are going to be there to watch it. It's going to do it on its own, right? But of course, you know, the first time you do anything, you, you have to be careful. And so um, so that's why everyone's around there. Uh, it was a very successful test, but to give you an idea of what my life looks like sometimes, this was meant to be a six hour test and it turned out to be a 12 hour test. And this is why we test. We found some problems, we fixed them and then ended up being very successful. So now we're on our way to Mars. As I mentioned, we launched in, in July and you think, all right, is your job done then? Like, is that it? The rover is gone? Absolutely not. <laughs> I am still testing. And in fact, I mentioned that I still go to lab regularly, um, even though we're in this sort of restriction at home. And the way that we do that is that we actually have a twin uh, to Perseverance called Optimism. And you see op Optimism right here and we drive her around the Mars yard. So Optimism is an exact twin of Perseverance. You can see right now in this picture, it does, she doesn't have her arm installed because the arm was in a different test bed. Um, the only difference actually is that you see there's a cable that's plugged into the wall. We obviously did not bring a cable to Mars, um, but that is actually the only difference and it allows us to test um, and specifically because I work on the mobility team, um, you know, part of my job is making sure that the rover can find its way on Mars. You know, there's, there's no GPS, there's no maps. Um, so the rover has to internally be able to orient itself 
we actually use the sun as our direction, just kind of like explorers use stars. Um, the rover can also self-drive, so we set up obstacle courses for it in the Mars yard, and and I get to go out there and drive it around and test it until it until it fails to drive itself, and it, it and it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's one of the hats I wear. This is also one of the tests that I did because one of the things that I work with is this little guy right there, which is Ingenuity. So Ingenuity is a helicopter that Perseverance is bringing along with it. We're going to drop it on the surface of Mars and Ingenuity is a technology demonstration. It's going to demonstrate the first powered flight on Mars. So while I'm on the Perseverance team, my uh, one of my jobs is to actually make sure that the um, the helicopter is deployed safely on the surface of Mars, and then I am coordinating all of the operations activities with um, with the helicopter. So things like the rover does all of the um, telecommunication relay. It does all of the imaging and the videos of the helicopter uh, when it's when it's on Mars, because obviously, you know, if you don't take pictures, it wasn't real, right? So we're going to make sure that we we do all of that, document everything, and I help coordinate with the helicopter team. So I kind of get to work on two missions, which is really cool. Um, so I want to end with this, this set of pictures here, um, because for me, Perseverance is really special. I actually started at JPL as an intern back in 2012 when Curiosity landed on Mars. And, and you can see bright-eyed Farah here. On, on one side uh, as an intern and you know I would go up my office was right by the Mars yard back then and I would go out to the Mars yard and look at the engineers sort of drive things around and I was knee deep in my PhD thinking like oh I just want to be done with this and come work here uh, and I remember landing day and seeing the team I was so excited when Curiosity landed and then and then doing those first few months of operations on Mars and now, you know, this picture is probably taken at 2 a.m. in the test bed, uh, but it's still a smile on my face because for me, it really is coming full circle of having seen this incredible team land a rover on Mars. And now I get to be part of the next cool rover that's that's going to land on Mars so soon. And and uh, that's just extraordinary for me to to, you know, be so privileged to be part of that team. Wow, Farah, thank you so much. It's so fascinating and we love hearing your story. And I uh, can't wait to ask you more questions about not only perseverance, but also about ingenuity, which is again, another engineering and science marvel. Now we'll hear from our third panelists. I'll now turn it over to Kim Stedman. Kim. Hey, thank you very much. It's hard to follow up those two amazing women, but I'll give it a go. Um, so Sarah told you about all these plans that, that we've been making for years and years and years. And Farah told you about, oh, we have to, build this rover and get her to Florida and launch her. And, and then the whole world will be watching when entry, descent and landing happens and, and our rover Perseverance touches her wheels down on Mars. And, and hopefully it will be very similar to the Curiosity rover's landing that was just picture perfect and everything went fantastic and everyone around the world applauded and cheered and jumped up and down. Although this time there's not gonna be so much hugging, but, um, that's great. That's a huge accomplishment. But this is when the job that the rover was built to do starts, is once she's actually on Mars. She's been cruising and now she's ready to arrive at Mars. And so in just a few weeks, which is really kind of scary for those of us who work on the pro project, we're going to land on Mars. And so this is uh, how we're going to land. Um, once we touch down, you can see our rover there underneath her descent stage, which will be cut away and this descent stage will fly away because the last thing we want is our descent stage to land on top of our rover. And then Perseverance will be all by herself. And the first thing we need to do is to get her ready for surface operations. Like anyone that goes on a very long trip, the first thing you have to do is unpack and get ready for what you're going to be doing. So we have to unpack. We have um, sh we have protective covers on our has camps that we need to eject. We have uh, a high gain antenna that is in launch lock and we need to release that so we can actually talk to our rover. Our arm is also in launch lock and the wind sensors on our weather station are in this protective sleeve and they need to pop out so that they can start giving us data. So those was one of the first things that we're going to be doing. And what we're also going to be doing is talking to every one of our instruments and our in instrument subsystem, our engineering subsystems to make sure, hey, did you survive that landing? Did you like your trip to Mars? Are you ready now to do some science and to drive around and have some fun? 
And so we have to do what we call checkouts of each of our instruments. And then we have to unstow the arm for the first time, which would be very exciting and see how all that works and talk to our instruments. And then Farah talked about the Ingenuity helicopter. Um, this is a technology demonstrator, like she said, but it's going to be very early in our mission. So we're going to, while we're doing all these checkouts of uh, the systems on the rover and making sure that she's happy, um, we're going to be looking for a place where we can safely deploy the helicopter. The helicopter rides uh, to Mars on the literally on the belly of our rover. And so we're going to just drop her to the ground and drive off like in that video. And hopefully it works just like that. And so the first thing we're going to do once we make a drive away from our landing area, which we've really made a mess of our landing area with our Mars landing engine. So we want to find a nice, pristine, gentle place to, to deploy Ingenuity, and then we'll do that. And then Ingenuity for 30 Mars days will be the star of the show. She's going to have up to hopefully five powered flights on Mars. So this is the first time we have ever tried powered flight on another planet and it's ridiculously exciting and I've been very lucky to be able to work on this team a little bit with Farah as their activity planner making sure that we can do everything we need to in one day within the power and the data volume that the rover has. So an interesting thing about Mars is the Martian day is very similar in duration to our day but it has this pesky almost 40 minutes extra a day which if you're in operations that makes life rather difficult because we like to talk to our rover and uplink to our rover every day around 9.30 a.m. her time. So that can be interesting for us. So first of all, I'll go over Saul and the life, and then I'll tell you why that 40 minutes makes all of our lives very difficult in the upcoming months. So what's going, what is Perseverance going to do after she's done all these checkouts, after she's made everything work, after she's let Ingenuity have her moment in the sun and fly all over Mars? Um, what are we going to do? Well, in the morning, the rover will wake up and she'll start to be aware of what's going on and she'll wait for us to talk to her. So we have these DSN stations, Deep Space Network, uh, three station, uh, three complexes around the world that allows us to talk to all of our spacecraft. Everybody's spacecraft talks to the Deep Space Network. So we use one of those antennas to send commands straight to the rover to tell her, here's your list of things to do today. And so once she receives that, that sequence and the activities, then she'll start to do them. She'll go about her business, making science. And after about half of her day is over, sometime in the early afternoon, one of the orbiters that are already at Mars that are doing their own science will take time out of their busy day to listen to our rover, send up some science data and some engineering data. And here's our orbiter going over and getting the data. Now, along with their own scientific data, they're going to take the data that we've given them and they're going to send it back to Earth to us. But while that happens, while we're all on Earth waiting for the data to come back, our rover continues her day. She's going to use all of her instruments that she's been told to use that day, and she's going to continue collecting data, and maybe she's even going for a drive or unstowing that arm and uh, using those uh, Pixel and Sherlock on the end of the arm to do some fantastic science. Um, and then on Earth, we're receiving the downlink of what she had done up until that afternoon pass. So we have a couple of jobs when we get data from the rover. We have downlink assessment. Downlink means that we are receiving instrument down from the rover. And so we've got a whole group of engineers and representatives from each scientific instrument will be in a room and they will look at the data that comes down and they will give up what we call a go, no go. They will say, my instrument is happy and healthy on Mars, and it's a go to use it in the next SOL plan. So every instrument does that, every uh, subsystem. So the engineers all participate in that. And uh, then while they're doing that, the uplink team, the team that's going to build those files that tell the rover what to do tomorrow, start planning. They've inherited a plan that was built the previous day for them. But now what they have to do is look at the data that comes down and say, does this plan still make sense? Do we still want to do that? If like we had done a drive and we got down post-drive imaging, suddenly all of our scientists have these images of what's directly in front of the rover and they can just talk for hours on which rock do we want to touch? Which rock do we want to shoot with our, our lasers? And what kind of science objectives do we want to try and accomplish today? And so these people do this. So you have people from the engineering team and you have the instrument representatives and you have the science team participating. So this can be a rather large meeting. And 
always people are scattered all around the world because our instruments are coming from many different nations, but it's going to be even more so this time since we're in the middle of COVID. So some of our engineers and all of our science uh, representatives that from the instrument teams will be working off lab and a smaller team will be on lab to make sure that everything happens like we expect it to do. And so these people will take this plan that they inherited, they will spiff it up, fine tune it a little bit, and then they will build all the files and the sequences that need to go up to the rover. They will validate them. They will make sure that, yes, what I want to do is I want to take an uh, image with mass cam Z and I want to image this thing over here. So they build the sequence, they run it through um, testing, not actually on the rover, but more through software, and they say, yes, uh, that's what I meant to command. Looks like what I'm commanding, and so I'm going to deliver this. And the sequence integration engineer will take all of those sequences and put it into a nice little bundle that's very easy to send up to our rover. And so the next morning, we will shoot that back up to, to the rover. And so now she has her full plan for the next day because we don't want to leave her up there doing nothing because there's lots to do when you're on Mars. So I told you about that pesky 40 minutes. So I, I'm sure everyone who's watching this has probably heard about the people on Curiosity and before that the Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity. And even before that on the Pathfinder Rover, when they first land, they worked this thing called Mars Time. What that means is you want to sync your time with the rover on Mars. And so when we get the downlink, that's when our day starts. And so on landing day on February 18th, our downlink will come sometime in the early afternoon and the downlink engineers and instrument teams will start their job and that's going to happen. I think Farah said she's working like 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. or something. And so in the early afternoon, they're going to be looking at the rover and then about 5 p.m. the uplink team comes in. And so we have until about 9.30 a.m. the next morning on Mars to get all of this, uh, the sequence is ready to go up to what we call the bundle. So we work about, it's going to be about a 10 hour shift. So we have, an, but we have a hard cutoff on when we have to uplink to the rover. So the problem comes the next day because now you, you shift later in the day. And so that 40 minutes is added to when your start time, but also there's latency from when those orbiters get the data to when they send it to us. It's not instantaneous. And so our start times can shift by up to about three hours every day. And so what you do is you do this sort of um, really bad jet lag march. One day you'll come in at 5.30, get off at 3 a.m. The next day maybe you come in at 6.30, get off at 4 a.m. And then you keep marching through the day and eventually you're coming in at midnight and, and going home at 10 a.m. And then it'll cycle back around. and the glorious day will happen when you're actually going to work at 8 or 9 a.m. and you really don't know what day it is anymore. And so that that's what working on Mars time is like. Uh, this will be the first time that we've done Mars time mostly remote. And so that will bring up some interesting challenges like um, if you have someone living with you and they actually have a normal human job, then while you're on your computer in the living room trying to do the uplink process for the Sherlock instrument, they're trying to sleep. So it's going to be quite interesting how this is going to work. And what do I do? Well, that is always the hardest question that I'm asked because I seem to be on every team possible. And whenever I get an email, I've joined a new team. So I'm a, for that surface operations transition, the transition from crews to actually doing stuff on the surface. I'm an activity planner for that. I'm an activity planner for the helicopter for Ingenuity. I'm also the operations lead for one of our most fantastic instruments, not that I'm biased, uh, the Sherlock instrument, which has actually two portions to it. One is the Sherlock spectrometer and the other one is the Watson imager because Sherlock cannot go to Mars without Watson. And then I'm also what they call a tactical integration lead. That room that I showed you uh, wherever all the uplink team is trying to do things, the tactical integration lead is the one who makes sure that we finish on time, have something actually ready to send to Perseverance. And I think I talked too long, but that's it. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much to the three of you. I have so many questions. I know we have a limited amount of time and we actually put out to our constituents if they wanted to submit questions and we got a number of questions as well. And so my first question actually probably goes more toward Farah and Kim. What is the power source for both Ingenuity and for Perseverance? You know, some vehicles that we send to space are solar 
Um, but I'm wondering what actually is the powertrain? What what enables these vehicles to function? Yes, I can take that one. Um, so it's a little bit different for both. Uh, so Perseverance actually uses a radioactive source. So it uses the decay from that from the plutonium and the heat that comes from that in order to both warm the rover and produce energy. Um, so the reason why we can't use solar panels for Perseverance is just because you can see it right even on this picture that uh, that's on the screen right now it's got a giant arm it's got a drill it's got a ton of instruments and and mars is further away from the sun than earth is so there just wasn't enough space to have solar panels big enough to uh, to support a rover like perseverance and that's why we use a radioactive source ingenuity however is a little bit different so right now as kib mentioned ingenuity is tucked into the belly of the rover and it has essentially an umbilical. So the rover is the power source for uh, the helicopter and we recharge the batteries now in cruise and, and uh, up to landing. But then the special thing is that once, you know, that, that day that we deploy Ingenuity, uh, we're going to drop it on the ground and that will expose its solar panels. However, one of the tricky things, right, is that the, helic the helicopter is actually below the rover when we drop it. So one of the things that's really important the day that we deploy the helicopter is the rover has to drive off of it that same day so that we can expose the solar panels and get enough energy for uh, the helicopter to survive the night. So, um, so Ingenuity uses those solar panels and then a tiny battery and that allows it to survive, um, to survive the night and then it recharges during the day and so on. So how long will both of the vehicles be active on the surface of Mars? I know that some of the past vehicles have had a life beyond what was anticipated. How long do you think that both Perseverance and Ingenuity could collect data? <laughs> so scientific instruments. I think uh, JPL engineers have a tendency to overdesign things a little bit. Um, so we tend to outperform our, our goals. Um, so the, you know, the, the prime mission for Perseverance is one Mars year. So that's about two Earth years. Right? That's the time it takes Mars to do an orbit around the sun. Um, and so we're planning all of our activities to fill that Mars year and, and make sure that we get everything done in that time. However, I mean, Curiosity had, you know, landed in 2012 and it's still going strong and it's certainly not going to be the power source that will go first. Right. So um, so there's other things that can decay over time and, and, you know, and become less effective over time. For example, Curiosity has issues with its wheels. That's why we redesigned the wheels on Perseverance. So, so it's hard to tell how long Perseverance will last. Ingenuity, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, the reason why we, you know, drop her on the ground so much earlier is because Ingenuity is a tech demo. We did not overdesign her. In fact, she's so small that we can't have, you know, for example, Perseverance carries two computers. It carries lots of cameras. So if anything breaks, every, you know, a lot of things are redundant. We didn't have that luxury with Ingenuity. Um, so. She's designed for a 30 sol prime mission. Um, so that means that, you know, we don't, we, we expect to try and fly her a few times, but she's not the main mission. So eventually, once she's demonstrating what she needs to do, we'll actually leave her behind because Perseverance has to go explore the rest of Mars. So we actually don't expect ingenuity to last much longer than, than that period of time. And if I can jump in, um, the, a lot of the, the way that we design these these missions, we basically have to guarantee to NASA that we're going to do this particular science and we're going to have um, and our, our robot, our machines are going to last for prime mission. And um, so far as team does a lot of, you know, it's called lifetime testing. We we have to know that it's going to last for one Mars year. That means that once you're through with that one Mars year, everything should still be working. And so we then, as scientists, write up a proposal. OK, we got here's all the science we got done. Here's all the cool science we could still do because the rover hardware is still working. And then we turn that into NASA and that's how we um, try and get uh, money for extended missions. So it's the combination of um, the fantastic engineering and, and testing that the engineering team has done combined with us on the science side being like there's still compelling science that we can do 
and then NASA saying, yes, we agree with both of you that the engine that the, you know, the hardware is still working, even as it starts, things start to break. You figured out how to keep going. Uh, you know, you've creatively solved a problem of like, oh, the, the wheels are going strange. Let's drive backwards and things like that. And the scientists are like, hey, if we can keep driving, then we can get to this spot and we can have it'll be like a whole new science mission because it'll be a new spot on Mars that we can put all of our instruments down on. I think it's a really big engineering challenge to build a rover, but then when the rover actually gets to Mars and things start to break, like Sarah said, as they do because Mars is a very difficult environment and it always is very tricksy for us. Um, the, the, the fun, fun, fun engineering is figuring out how to keep going when things are breaking and to do workarounds and to keep drilling. Like uh, the Curiosity rover had uh, a problem with her drill and uh, they had to basically reinvent how to use it. And so they tested it on Earth first and then sent the commands up to Mars and they didn't work the first couple of times they tried to drill with the, the new paradigm and they had to you know, start again and work around that and then figure it out. And that's it's very challenging, it's very exciting. Well, I think that's actually the story of space exploration, right? The best designed, best laid plans, there's always some unanticipated or even an anticipated wrench that gets thrown into the plans and makes it more complicated and you have to kind of find a workaround. And it's something that I love about interacting with people like you and other scientists and engineers in space exploration. You have to be so creative yet so disciplined, right? There is a focus to what you're doing, but then you have to have the flexibility to go with whatever gets presented to you. So I'm really curious to, to hear more about um, what you hope to find on Mars. What are some of the assumptions? Um, you know, I have to say, Sarah, when you were talking about how you were identifying what the science projects are, oh my gosh, there must be tens of thousands of things that you could be researching. And then, then you have to, of course, design the machine, right, to, to fit the, the requirements for doing those experiments. Um, and you described the process a little bit, but who ultimately decides what those priorities are for the science missions? There is sort of a multi-tiered answer to that question. Um, every approximate, every 10 years, the, the, plan, the, the um, planetary science community gets together and, and holds what we call the decadal survey. And we're actually doing this right now um, the decadal survey the next decadal survey is being assembled and you know it's a series of, pa of people submitting papers and getting other people to sign their papers and calling into town meetings and arguing and then ultimately what happens is that a document is produced and it summarizes the the community the, the scientific community's priorities for exploring the solar system in the next decade and then that gets handed to NASA. And so in the previous decadal survey, they actually said um, Mars sample return and Europa are the top two avenues of exploration uh, for the planetary community. Now, of course, there's a ton of other scientific questions that um, lots of people would love to have answered. Um, every scientist has their own little, uh, you know, their passion and their area of expertise, and that's part of how we get into big arguments about how to what what to what to do next. Um, and so, you know, we try and have guidelines for for priorities and what are the questions that have bubbled up throughout the entire community. NASA has. Um, they have flagships, which are these giant programs, these giant spacecraft, um, the super complicated ones. And then they have a series of other smaller missions that members of the community can propose to. So um, uh, Curiosity is a flagship. Uh, Perseverance is a flagship. Europa Clipper, which is in work right now, is also flagship. But then there's also these missions like um, uh, InSight, Mars InSight was in the news recently. Um, it's a lander doing uh, geophysics. That one was proposed through the community. Um, and there's the Psyche, there's one, there's missions to, to asteroids. There's 
a lot of other missions. I think there's some missions to the moon that are coming up through those programs. So that's kind of how you get there's so that's why there's so many different ways to do it with this particular mission with perseverance. What we and the science definition team were handed. OK. You need to you need to um, we're going to do another rover. It's going to be as close to Curiosity as possible to help uh, just reuse as much of the engineering planning as possible, and it needs to be um, it needs to meet the the major Mars community objectives concerning astrobiology and concerning getting ready for um, for for sample return from Mars. And so that was our guidance. And then, you know, again, a series of arguments uh, worked our way through. This is the particular sort of science we want to do. We want to land somewhere, understand the geology, understand that geology is the history. It's like the pages, the layers of the rock or the pages of the history book, if you can only figure out how to read them. And but we want to then understand the potential for um, habitability. Could one of the environments in this area have hosted life? Can we find all the building blocks to support life? Um, can we find, and that's a lot of what Curiosity has done well. With Perseverance, we're taking that extra step of, can we actually find any potential evidence of life? Any of these potential, these subtle patterns, these potential biosignatures? Um, and as part of that, we said, okay, here's the kinds of measurements that you need to take in order to do that. Here's the details. This is the kind of chemistry on this kind of scale that you have to do in order to do that. And so from that science definition team's document stating all of this, that got released out to the, it's it's out for the world and it's, you know, it's online somewhere. And um, so then scientists and engineers got together and said, hey, you know, I've been working on developing an, this instrument in my lab or, or I have some ideas about here's a, an instrument that we've previously flown on, you know, on Curiosity or on um, Spirit and Opportunity. Here's how we can tinker with it and make it, make it take the kinds of measurements that you're talking about. And again, series of arguments, lots of proposals came in. This batch of instruments were selected. So um, that's that's the progression for this particular one. Um, and yeah, and so we're really hoping to find um, those little those those patterns in the chemistry, those those little patterns in the shapes of the rocks that um, really tend to form in the presence of of life, but it's 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 a hard question to answer, and that's why the sample return aspect is so important for us. Fascinating. Well, something that really intrigues me is the the amount of carbon dioxide on Mars, right? Because that to me is like a huge signature of wow, you know, because carbon is what we assume is a building block of life right here on Earth, and you know, carbon dioxide suggests that that's some byproduct, right, of some kind of life form or life process. And so I know that um, the Mo I'm really intrigued by the MOXIE, which is looking at how to somehow convert that. So how do you, how do you actually design something like that um, that can either can look at assess the carbon dioxide and see if it can and somehow be broken down into its elements of carbon and oxygen? What they've done specifically with MOXIE is um, so so it's this concept called in situ resource utilization. ISRU, because we love our acronyms. Um, and the the idea is that um, we want to understand how we can use the resources at Mars rather than having to bring just a huge amount of resources with us when we send humans, because humans, we need a lot of stuff, right? Like we just, we, we have, <laughs> We, we need to bring stuff to live in. Um, and uh, so in the case of Mars, the atmosphere is very, very thin and it is a, almost entirely carbon dioxide. Now that's not likely, to, so carbon dioxide is also a huge byproduct of geology, not just biology. And so on Mars, 
it's all geologic processes that have produced all this carbon dioxide. Um, but what we've done is there's there's a group who they've figured out basically it's like running a fuel cell in reverse. And so sucking in carbon dioxide and running it through some special boxes, basically, I don't know all the details, uh, to spit out um, oxygen uh, and CO. And then just we're just going to vent that out. And this is this, they know how it works on the Earth and they think they know how it should work on Mars. But as Kim was mentioning earlier, um, Mars is very tricksy and Mars always surprises us. So we we think we know how it's going to work. And so with Moxie, we're sending a little box of this to see to compare how it breaks on Mars to how it see if we can explain that in the lab. And so we want to be able to to do this before we send any bigger version that humans would actually rely on. So it is um, it is a form of technology demonstration almost as well. We're, we're going to, to learn a lot from how does this technology work on Mars to be able to build the next one. Fascinating. Well, I wanted to ask um, Kim and, and Farah, you also talked about how you have to adapt to Mars time. And um, I know that here at Johnson Space Center, you know, we're the center of astronaut training and we you know, put astronauts through different kinds of timing. We, we synchronize their, their schedule with GMT time before they go to International Space Station. And they were very rigid, right? Because humans are pretty fragile and it's hard to put us in these environments that we're not adapted to. But how do you prepare for that type of schedule? You know, coming up on February 18th, you're gonna be in this cycle, right? Of constantly shifting schedules and we're humans. I mean, we really need sleep, we need rest, we need um, our circadian rhythm to keep ourselves well. Do you condition yourselves in any way to prepare for supporting those missions? Um, how do you get ready for it beyond just powering through? Well, I think I forgot to say that uh, we'll be on Mars time for only about the first 90 days. And so as soon as you get on Mars time, you can sort of see the end of Mars time. Um, I don't think there's a great way to prepare for it because of just the change in start time every day. That's the problem. And so people that have done this always and they, they say it's just like being jet lagged for 90 days. And um, so I'm making plans on making my bedroom dark during the day so that I can maybe get some sleep um, and getting some nice ear, ear covers so that I when you know I live in Pasadena and it seems like once you get to about 9 or 10 a.m. that's when everyone gets their their saws out to cut boards or those leaf blowers to you know, cut the grass and so it's a very very loud place sometimes in the middle of the day so that's the challenges that I'm preparing for um, I my favorite story of uh, the Mars time and the best way I can sum up the, the how it affects people was um, I, I can't remember I think it was on one of the Mars exploration rovers or it doesn't really matter but this guy did his Mars time shift at JPL and he got in his car and he drove to Santa Monica and, and you know if you're here Santa Monica is one to three hours away from JPL depending on when you're going in traffic and so he did this long commute to Santa Monica he pulled into the driveway and he realized that he sold that house last year and had moved closer to work to Pasadena <laughs> So he had to turn around and drive right back to Pasadena because he really actually lived only three miles from the lab. So they've they've given us a lot of advice on on how to deal with it. And they're the people that are making the schedules, making the you know, schedule staffing schedules for every role are are going into training to to learn to try and make sure their people can keep going. And so they have roles like you're not supposed to do three or four shifts in a row and things like that. So. It's going to be a, a really good learning experience. I think of the three of us, actually, I think Sarah may be the only one that's done Mars time. Yeah, I lived on Mars time uh, the summer of 2008 for the Mars Phoenix lander. And um, yeah, that at that time, um, that particular mission, we were running it out of Tucson, Arizona. So I basically moved to Tucson, lived in an apartment, put tinfoil over all my windows, um, had yeah, earplugs and everything, left family behind kind of thing um, and, and just lived Mars time. So even on my days off, 
I still stuck roughly to the Mars time schedule. And it is a mind trip. It really is. Um, uh, this time, the real challenge, is, as Kim was saying earlier, is, is you know, f like now I have a child. And he, so I have to try and figure out the balance of checking in on how Zoom school is going and, and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, it's going to be an adventure. Well, you know, it's so interesting. I'm going to make reference to another thought leader program we did back in December, which is Illuminating Space, and we focused on circadian rhythm and how important it is for human explorers in space. I recommend you guys watch it. There were some great tips in there about how to adapt your, your circadian rhythm and things that I researched here at the, the Human Health and Performance Directorate at, at uh, the offices here at Johnson Space Center. But I really admire all the work that you're doing. That is really, really challenging. Um, what are some of the things that you were most curious um, to find out from the, from the mission, from Perseverance and Ingenuity? Are there, I know there are a plethora of things that you've worked on, but are there particular things that you each personally are really interested or curious about question-wise that you hope will be addressed through this mission? Maybe far up, I'll start with you. If you if there's something that you're you're just really excited about, you know, professionally that you're hopeful that you'll you'll understand or perseverance will help us to 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 know something about or learn something about. Sure. Um, so I think my answer is probably gonna be a little bit different from Sarah's and Kim's, and it just reflects what my background is, right? So yeah, super excited about all the science. Obviously, I mean. Let's talk about it for a second. If we actually find signs of ancient life on Mars, right, that is groundbreaking and and just affects our entire view of who we are and where we come from, and, and that's extraordinary. So, so obviously that's the answer that you know I'd like to get answered. But outside of the science, for me personally, what I'm most excited about is, I mean, there's two things. First is like that first flight on Mars? I mean, come on, this is the first time we're going to fly on another planet. It's not even been that long that we could fly on Earth, right? And now we're saying, yeah, we're going to go to this planet all the way over there and fly a quadcopter over there and have fun, right? And so to me, that is such an incredible feat, right, an achievement. And, you know, if you look at the first time we, we drove a rover on Mars, which was also not that long ago and how far we've come, Again, I can think of this as being a stepping stone, you know, sort of a groundbreaking tech demo that could lead to all sorts of really cool exploration. So that's one. And the other that I'm really excited about is this rover I mentioned briefly can self-drive. And so we can say at the end of the day, hey, Perseverance, like drive that way for 200 meters, we'll see you tomorrow, right? And and Curiosity can do some of that, but Perseverance can travel much greater distances. I mean. The furthest a, a rover is driven on Mars on a single day is around 220 meters. I think it's one of the Mars exploration rovers. We're going to be driving sort of record distances every day, right? And But the coolest thing, if you think about it, is, I mean, all of you are going to watch landing and there'll be a picture that's going to come down of landing and you see this new area on Mars and, and you know, we're the first, the first time we see this place on Mars. Well, if you think about it, if you're going to be driving 200 meters a day, Every time you drive and you go home, go to sleep, the rover's driving, the next morning when you come back, the images that you're gonna see are from an area that no one's seen before. So every day we're gonna get that feeling of coming in with someone new, oh my gosh, there's rocks, there's this thing over here, there's this thing over here, right? Like it, it is just to me, that's like, that's the joy of being part of a mission like this is that I get to be an explorer through the rover's eyes. I get to, I mean, I get to be an explorer on Mars, but from the comfort and warmth of Southern California, right? And and that is incredible. So so yes, I'm super excited about you know all the cool science that that's going to happen. But for me, those those two moments I think are going to be kind of the highlights for me personally because I will have con contributed to those happening. Great, uh, Kim. How about for you? Well, uh, a little bit like Farah. It's, it's it's you know it's not that. I'm looking forward to a single scientific discovery. I think that once once Perseverance gets there, there's going to be surprises every day. There's going to be things we didn't expect. We're going to be seeing things that the scientists don't understand. Uh, I worked on the Opportunity Rover for several years and it was very exciting. And to me, the most exciting thing about it is that uh, for the first time when 
when the Mars Exploration Rovers landed, Spirit and Opportunity, not only were they moving around on a planet and, you know, because we had had rovers on the moon before, but now here we were exploring Mars. But the way that the missions work is not only do we explore Mars, but we take everybody with us. And so it was sort of like Spirit and Opportunity saying, here, here, come with me. Let me show you what, what I saw today, because all of our images go straight to the public side. And so the public is with us on this journey. And to me, that is the most exciting thing because it's a, a you know, it's a multi-nation, you know, we have instruments from all over the world, just like the other rovers did. And so we're just this huge team that together we do this great thing. But the most exciting thing about it is that that everybody that wants to can can go with us. And, and that's, it's just an amazing thing to be able to go talk to people and, and, and hear how, how excited they are about the work that we do and how appreciative they are. And it's, it's just, it's a lot of fun talking to kids and that gets them so excited. That's what I'm looking forward to. Great, and, and Sarah? I think um, I, I share a lot of that, um, just excitement about the exploration and the, the being part of the team that gets to, to see all these new places for the first time and, and do that sort of on behalf of humanity that's a big big part of the draw for me um and i can't pick out any one given piece of science or science instrument because it's a little bit like trying to pick a favorite child on some level um but for me personally this this rover is the first time that i've joined a project so early and this this whole rover at one point was a set of PowerPoint slides on my computer as the science team documentarian. And then it was a giant Word document that I was trying to corral about 15 people trying to edit it simultaneously and it crashed my computer. And like when and it's been a long journey since then and a lot of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears from a lot of people. But there was something amazing at launch, seeing, like, just watching the launch remotely and thinking, like, there is real hardware that this has all turned into. It is now, it is, it is a thing. And I am just so looking forward to that then being on Mars and kind of turning it over to the science team and 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 watching them uh, explore and and watching them use the all of the things that we have built and designed for them and um, seeing it all sort of come to life off of our whiteboards is has been really amazing for me. Well, thank you all so much. This has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. And what I say about Space Center Houston is we're in the business of awe and wonder. That's how I think of space exploration. And I think you all embody that. And I'm so thankful to you for participating in this thought leader program and sharing the insider perspective on how these missions come to life and how we manage them and what we hope to learn from them. And I'm just really blown away and impressed by all three of you and your achievements and what you're contributing to science and humanity and the work that you're doing. And I'm so excited to welcome you back again after Ingenuity and um, uh, Perseverance around the surface of Mars, because I'm really so curious about some of the data that you're going to find and what the significance of that is. So I'm we're coming to the close of our program today and want to thank everyone for joining us. And if you'd like more information about uh, this mission and other science missions, please go to our uh, website, spacecenter.org. You can read more about it. And then, of course, we're going to be having a landing viewing here at Space Center Houston on February 18th, and it's going to be at about 2 p.m. Central Time. So we hope that you'll come on site. Again, thank you so much to our panelists today. Uh, we wish you great success and get, hopefully getting some rest during that 90-day uh, period of being on the Martian uh, daily cycle. And we look forward to our viewers joining us on a future uh, program here at Thought Leaders at Space Center Houston. Thank you again for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.